this is Sherry, and I have the pleasure of having Arch Crawford from Crawford Perspectives with me today. Arch has a website and a newsletter for subscribers regarding the financials, and he's a financial advisor in the way of the astro cycles and planetary alignments. He's been doing this since the 1970s. Arch was a financial advisor in the first place, and then he began looking and studying and researching what the financials, the stock market did, going all the way back to the 1800s to see what the market did at what points from solar flares to, uh, to the uh, eclipses, and he has been able to predict what the markets are going to do through the astro cycles. Even in 2001, he predicted that between September 7th and 8th that there would be war. Well, he was off only by a couple of days because we know what happened at uh, was September 11th of 2001. Arch is here today, not about the financials per se, but he also, from studying the sun, the alignments, he has a prediction that's a pretty uh, intense prediction for this coming month, and actually uh, November 13th or the 23rd. And Arch is here to uh, talk to me about it and everything he does, so I want to welcome him. Uh, hi, Arch, you there? Yes, I am. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me um, about what you do. Um, I think it's absolutely amazing, as I was telling the, the everybody listening. I mean, you, you've you done this since 1977 in the way of the astro cycles and planetary alignments. Tell me what got you interested in it in the first place, please. Well, I was a technical market analyst at Merrill Lynch when uh, an article came out on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about people using astrology in the stock market. That was actually the day before my birthday in 1963. So I've been doing it since then, uh, but I only started my newsletter in May of 77. And you went all the you did the research all the way back to the 1800s to how the market uh, the Dow does? Uh, explain that to me. That's amazing. Well, I used the, 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 the information that was available, and the Dow Jones is calculated from, uh, I think, 1885 or 1888. And you, you, you were able to correspond to what the Dow did to certain astro cycles or what the sun and the planets did, correct? That's correct. And, and what did you find? I mean, what was some of the uh, reoccurring themes that you found from uh, eclipses or, or alignments? Well, I think one of the most important things is the eclipses. Uh, and some of the other really important things are when a planet changes sign. Um, and when there are, the, the most important thing altogether is when several planets are, are in harmonic contact with each other at the same time. Uh, one of those uh, really the most important incident of uh, conjunctions was the harmonic convergence. Uh, many people remember that as, uh, as a big new age thing and they were dancing and meditating and drumming and uh, at sacred sites around the world. Uh, because Jose Arguelles uh, thought the date was uh, August the 17th of 1987. And I looked at that date, astrologically speaking, and I didn't see any big deal. So I was going forward one day at a time, looking at it on my computer. And one week later, uh, August the 24th, 87, was the tightest five planet conjunction in at least 800 years that I checked. And I said, this market will peak on August the 24th, give or take three days, after which we will have a horrendous crash. I wrote that in my newsletter on August the 8th, 
87. The market, the high close on the, on the Dow Jones was August the 24th. And then it, uh, the market started dropping and dropped, was picking up speed on the downside uh, until September the 22nd. Um, and September 22nd, 87 was a solar eclipse on the fall equinox. And that's, that's uh, a really, really powerful combination of an equinox and, a, and an eclipse. Uh, that morning, uh, the market hit a low, um, scared traders pretty much uh, by breaking another important level, turned around and had the biggest up day in history in points, which at that time it was 70 points uh, in 87, and that was the biggest up day ever on record. It went up for two weeks. Uh, and on the top day, uh, the, after the two weeks, there was a lunar eclipse. I think it was October the uh, 6th. <clears throat> and um, that was the biggest down day in history and started the slide into the crash of 87. The crash actually took place on October 19th. Um, and again, uh, another important point on that was uh, option expiration was Friday the 16th, and the market was down so much that the institutions and big, big holders of stocks that were selling put options, were selling options, were losing their, uh, losing heavily and getting margin calls, and they tried to hold the market up until option expiration Friday. Now, it, they were not holding it very well, but it was, it was down more in the morning and they managed to bring it back up to only down um, a little over 100 points on uh, Friday option expiration. And then Monday they let it go. <laughs> and Monday was the crash. So it was the uh, Monday after option expiration, October the 19th. Actually, the low was the next morning because um, it crashed 508 points, and that was over 22%, between 22 and 23%, the biggest down day in history. And um, the, the next morning, the market was down 250 points in the first 15 minutes, and there weren't even many stocks open at that time. So Greenspan, who had just come on as Fed chairman, uh, told the banks, if anybody comes in from Wall Street and asks for money, give it to them. And the next 15 minutes, the market recovered the 250 points and about 12 more. So at quarter to 10 Eastern time, the market was down 250. At 10 o'clock, it was up 12 points. <laughs> <laughs> That's that what the Fed the can do track. for you, right? What's that? That's what the Fed can do for you. Just throw uh, uh, print some money. Well, it, it can do it when everybody is really crazy. It has an effect. It doesn't necessarily have an effect uh, day to day, but um, they have been able to, uh, by an announcement, make some considerable uh movements in the market from time to time. Well, you have you were able to see that coming. And since then, you have, um, from my understanding, pretty much almost, you're spot on each time, correct? I mean, you, you're able to predict things within days. Well, I predicted every uh, crash that has occurred since I've been uh, in the business. The first one I predicted while a, a technical analyst at Merrill Lynch, and I predicted it by purely technical means. I wasn't into the astrology yet, but uh, uh, I, I told him that at Merrill Lynch that if this pattern remains uh, symmetrical, this was in November of uh, 61, I said if this pattern remains uh, symmetrical, the market should top around the middle of December and crash next year, 1962. And uh, what happened was the high was actually December the 13th, and then the market 
uh, continued to roll, uh, putting on a, a head and shoulder top, and it, it rolled the, the right shoulder out two or three rolls, and it broke the neckline of the head um, in the middle of April. It was the day that John Kennedy made the steel companies roll back a price increase. That start that broke the neckline of the important uh, support level and started to drop into the crash. And the crash occurred on May the 29th. <clears throat> and that was, I think, the first high volume uh, crash since 1929. We'd had down markets, certainly, but nothing, uh, nothing like the speed and volume of the uh, 1929 crash in October and the 62 crash in May it was the first time you had anything like that uh, in that quality. Okay. Then, uh, when 1987 came up, uh, I was ready for that. Then uh, the next one was uh, 2001 and 2002. And um, on September the 4th of 2001, I wrote that the market would crash by October the 5th and uh, the United States will be at war around the 7th or 8th of September 2001 and, I'm, and on 9-11-2001 George Bush uh, the president said we are at war on the TV. Right. So I missed it three days but uh, that was pretty good call and I got a call from the FBI in Phoenix after that. So you got a call from the FBI regarding your prediction of us going to war? Uh, 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 September 20, 2001? Yes, September. I figured it would be the, around the September the 7th or 8th. And of course it hit on 9-11. Wow. And, 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 and how did you, I mean, they, they called you and, and what did you say? Hey, it's, it's from planetary alignment or what? That's what I said. And, uh, the guy talked to me about 40 minutes and I said, I predicted these other things like the day that Sam Hussein attacked Kuwait and the day the challenger exploded and a bunch of other days. And I can send you that information if you like. And he said, no, that's all right. Um, I, you, I, that's amazing too. I know you, you were able to predict, you, you predicted the Challenger, the Chernobyl, the Princess Diane. I mean, not those specifically, but that something was going to happen during those days. And am I correct? It was due to eclipses and so on that you, you were able to predict that? And other planetary alignments, yes. The, the Chernobyl exploded four days after a lunar eclipse. Uh, and I had said, if you don't feel this one, you're probably not alive. And what happened is it raised the uh, radiation levels worldwide. So we all did feel it on a subconscious level. It affected our bodies. Right. Now, we have a solar eclipse coming up the third. We did just have a lunar eclipse. Um, tell me about your latest um, uh, predictions of, of what's going to be happening. Uh, just let, let me figure one point that was uh, rather strange that you mentioned, the, Diana's death. Um, I looked up the alignments on that day uh, in a book that was written in the 1910s uh, by a German, um, and it said, tragic love and that's what i wrote in my newsletter for that date and that was the day she died wow wow you you really have a gift i mean it, it really is amazing um what do you see now uh, i'm going to be getting into one of these predictions that you have regarding uh, this november and the the sun and kill shot um that is if if there's any, I would think, of the scariest predictions ever, that would be, to me, um, the scariest prediction ever due to planetary alignments. And um, so, uh, I mean, because that would definitely affect 
all of us in a very negative way. Tell me about that and how you came up with that. Okay, uh, first, if you want me to cover the things that are happening in the next uh, few days first, uh, November 1st will be the fourth of seven Uranus-Pluto squares. And uh, that I expect to be a big deal as well. Now, uh, I remember back when we, we were all uh, worried about the uh, Mayan calendar date, December 21st, 2012, and astrologers were looking at that date, and, and we didn't see any big deal there, but we were coming up to this Uranus-Pluto sequence, a series of those squares that will take place over three and a half years. Um, and they were much more fearful of the Uranus-Pluto squares than they were of the Mayan calendar date. And uh, the Uranus-Pluto squares have been associated generally with uh, depressions and major depressions and major wars. So we get another one of those November the 1st. Oh. And on November the, thir the 23rd, we get, uh, th this is because um, looking out from the Earth, the Earth goes uh, around the Sun, and it, so it comes back to the same uh, position several times relating to the very, very far out planets. But um, uh, so th th this occurs several times, but the looking out from the Sun's surface, uh, it only occurs once because you don't have retrograde planets in uh, looking out from the Sun. And it's only the Earth's movement that makes it appear that thing planets are going backwards, but they, they appear to go backwards and then forwards and then backwards and forwards with the Earth going around the Sun in a different direction and then coming back. So that's the explanation for it, but um, um, there, there's only one looking out from the Sun, and that's uh, November the 23rd, but on uh, the 13th, it's, it's within like two or three minutes of arc. That's like one twentieth of one degree, uh, almost to the square when Jupiter comes by and opposes Pluto and squares Uranus. Uh, that is the tightest alignment of a, of a T-square, where two planets are opposing and another one is square both of them. Uh, the tightest alignment that I have ever seen, even looking back years and years. So it may be the tightest one in history, in all of written history. So the biggest uh, solar storm we have experienced uh, in written history, or when people were watching that sort of thing, was in September of, uh, I think it was 1859. And uh, the only electronics we had in a, in a spread out way was uh, telegraph. Well, what happened was that the telegraph machines went a little bit nuts and they were chattering, chattering, chattering. So it was, they couldn't send any messages. So they unplugged them. They kept on chattering from the electromagnetics that were in the air. Wow. And it set, it set some of the offices on fire. The equipment uh, caused sparks to fly out and set a couple of, uh, I don't know how many uh, Western Union offices on fire. Well, it looks like it's worse than that or more powerful than that. Really? Well, it's it has the possibility of, uh, well, if it's the biggest thing ever, uh, the worst case is that enough of the sun explodes to, to melt the earth. I do not expect that. Uh, the second worst thing is if it fries our electric grid, it could set us back a hundred years. And I don't know if that'll be for two or three weeks or two or three months, or uh, they won't get it back up for years. I, I don't know how, they, FEMA has been talking about that possibility. And um, who knows if they'll get it back up right away if it goes down. Um, the government has been putting pressure on some of the electric companies to upgrade um, the grid, and it is private, and uh, they have not done very much to improve the quality of our electrical grid, such that 40% of the generated electricity 
goes to waste out into the air because of uh, the uh, low quality of many of the connections and, and the way it's set out. So 40%, we could, we could get 40% 40, 40 more electricity out of it if it was 100% effective. But 100% uh, effective is too much to ask for anyway. But anyway, um, so I'm, FEMA has been telling people to get extra food and water to have in your house if, if, if the um, grid goes down for a week or two or three. But, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, there's two things about that that I want to mention. Okay. The two things are, did you know that the U.S. government is testing, happens to be testing and doing a grid test on November the 13th to the 14th nationwide. I did hear that. Yes. I did hear that. Isn't that funny that they're doing a testing on November 13th to the 14th? Also, did you know that the National Geographic did a, uh, they, they premiered a show two nights ago about the whole U.S. grid going down, and it was it was a two-hour show the other night. Did you watch that? I did not. You told me about it, actually. Yeah, and what they did is it's like when the grid went down. And you know, we, were, we were look watching, and we were just skipping channels, and we watched about 30 seconds of that and just said, wow, that's interesting, but we didn't stay on it. We didn't watch it. Yeah. We didn't know what it was, actually. <laughs> Well, one of the things that kept going over and over, and I noticed that they showed it in all the different scenarios, and and this is one of the things in the way of why of doing this interview, um, I believe everyone should have water, a couple of weeks at least supply of food. This is all basic. This isn't prepper. This isn't saying you're a prepper if you have this. It's smart. And I believe in your newsletter, you've also been saying, have water, have some food, just have some supplies to be able to be self-sufficient for a little while, correct? Yes, and, and some cash on hand just in case. Uh, well, one of, one of the things I've heard is that there is also a possibility that the, uh, there may be an attack a, a, a digital attack on the banking system, and that they uh, that it could occur on a Friday, and they'll say, "Oh, well, we'll fix it over the weekend." And over the weekend, uh, you get something like martial law. <laughs> I, I hope that's not true. So, but what you're saying, well, also, I, I guess you're familiar. All of a sudden, the sun has just become quite awake and quite active. I mean, we had three X flares in three days. Uh, we've had, I don't know how many M flares uh, that's happening, and two sun, very large sunspots that they're saying um, has 35, Space Weather says has a 35% chance of producing X flares because they're, they're delta, gamma, uh, magnetic sunspots or something like that. Are you? Um, I'm familiar. Uh, it looked to me like we should get some unusual activity around that time. Uh, on the 27th, Mercury was conjunct Uranus and squared Pluto. And on the 31st, which is day after tomorrow, the Earth squares Mars looking out from the sun's surface. Uh, but November 1st, uh, Mercury is conjunct the Earth, both square Mars, uh, and we might get some increased activity even more than we've seen yet. But uh, as we get on um, into the heavier uh, planetary events relative to the Sun, I would say the ninth is the first really big day, and the biggest day is the 13th. Plus or minus, these are plus or minus two or three days, by the way. Uh, and the 13th, and then the uh, 18th to the 20th, and then on the 23rd, and then the 29th, 30th. So this is going to be ongoing for a while, and it might die down a bit after 
December the 1st. There's still some further indications of activity, but they are not uh, up to those to that period. Then the uh, next biggest one is the 19th of December. Again, it's not as big as the uh, November period. So we have, uh, it sounds like November is going to be a pretty intense month overall. Uh, extremely. It'll, it, it'll set records for sunspot activity and flares. I, I am very well assured of that in, from the work that I've done. Now, John Nelson was this radio propagation specialist for RCA, and he... Um, well, they told him they wanted to know when these uh, flares are going to pop off and because it affected short wave communication. And in those days before satellites, uh, all the information flow, most of it across the North Atlantic, was by short wave. And when the, when the magnetic storms hit from the sun, uh, Radio Corp America had to swing down to South America and over to Africa and back up to Europe to complete that circuit, information circuit, and that was time consuming and costly. And they, so they wanted to know. So they put John Nelson on the roof of a building down in Wall Street with a six inch telescope and said, tell us when these things are gonna happen. Well, he, he did a lot of regular statistical work and could only get up to about 65% accuracy. And it was driving him to distraction somewhat. This, this was a hard-nosed New Englander engineer. He had no interest in astrology, but when someone said, well, why don't you look at the planetary alignment around the sun's surface, um, he had tried everything else. So he took the 13 worst magnetic storms on record at RCA and drew the heliocentric astrology charts and was absolutely amazed to find the no huge numbers of harmonic relationships among the planets went on at the onset of these magnetic storms. Wow. So, he wrote a book about how to do it called Cosmic Patterns. Um, and I think they still publish that at American Federation of Astrologers in Tempe, Arizona. And you do it really, it, it sounds like from <clears throat> how the planets go around the sun compared to um, astrologers on an individual basis, do, does it in the way of in the relationship to the earth, you do it in the relationship to the sun, correct? When I'm, tr when I'm trying to predict the sunspot activity, yes, in, in uh, I use the regular, I use <laughs> every everything I can use and that's Compute it. There are two ways to look at it geocentrically or Earth-centered. One is measuring it as astronomers do uh, by um, the Earth's equator. And so that's equatorial uh, longitude. And the way astrologers look at it is somewhat different. They follow the path of the sun, which um, is called the ecliptic. And so that's ecliptic longitude. And they will vary. Um, it can be a number of days in the far out planets, but it's usually just a few hours or a day or two in the uh, regular planetary alignment. There'll be differences in what the time and, uh, and date of some of the aspects. I, can't, I calculate all of them when I'm, when I'm really up to snuff. Well, it sounds like you calculate things amazingly and, and is very accurate. Um, well, all right, what? What was that? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. What was I saying? <laughs> well, you were just talking about the ecliptic and the way of how uh, astrology, astrology on the uh, individual basis. Oh, yes. When, when, the, um, when the alignments uh, involve several planets, the accuracy can be very, very high. Uh, in normal days where it's, you know, coming a little, going a little, coming a little, going a little, it uh, it's, makes it much harder to predict. But I've, I've predicted from the most dramatic alignments all along that something 
important would happen and something important did. Uh, what, another example is that um, um, I predicted in the newsletter, I was looking at this big alignment where there were several uh, conjunctions and oppositions and, and uh, powerful alignments and it was in uh, February of 2003 and it was clear that we were going to go to war with Saddam Hussein at some point and it the war actually was uh, slated as I think the 13th or 15th of 13th of March of 2003 well I said in my newsletter on February the 16th um, Saddam Hussein is going to attack our, people, our troops in Kuwait, or he's going to at attack Israel, or we are going to attack him on the 16th of February. Well, the 16th of February came and went, nothing on the TV, nothing in the newspapers, but a private um, intelligence service out of Israel reported a few days later, and this is what they said, 600 U.S. Special Forces and 60 Brits crossed over from Kuwait and took over the southern oil fields with hardly a shot being fired on February the 16th. So you got it exactly on. Right. And, and it, it has still never been admitted or, or appeared anywhere in the United States that I know of except in my newsletter. Wow. Now, I have a question. Uh, two th well, actually, two things. Um, one is metals, gold and silver. Um, what do you, I want to go ahead and ask you because that's, you know, those, I, I'm not a stock market uh, investor, but where, where do you see gold and silver going? Well, I, it's, people ask me what I see gold going up to, and I'm saying it's not what the gold goes up to, it's what the dollar goes down to. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make that uh, the answer. And I think uh, that over the next um, three years, many or most of the fiat currencies, currencies not backed by anything, which is all of them now, uh, will go to zero. And that there will be major uh, economic dislocations um, as the major currencies uh, lose value. That right now, the United States, Britain, and Japan are uh, printing money as fast as they can all together. And now Europe has uh, uh, joined them uh, in putting out huge quantities of euros, but not as much as ours. Right. Uh, but still pretty heavily. So I think they realize that the market, uh, that the world is going into a major depression and, and they are trying to stop it by printing as much money as the market will bear. And I think this is a last and dramatic, uh, desperate effort and it will eventually fail, although it may be successful for weeks or months. I don't think it's going to be successful for, re for years after now. Now, Arch, I want to thank you for spending the time to talk to me. How can people, uh, you have a, a, an amazing newsletter. How can people subscribe to your newsletter? Uh, talk, please tell me and tell everybody how they can uh, your website and how to subscribe to you. Okay, the website is Crawford Perspectives at uh, dot com, and uh, the easy way to get to it is just Google Arch Crawford, and that'll be the first one to come up, or second one, first or second. And um, I haven't been real good about keeping it up to date, but you can sign up for the letter there, and the, the cheapest thing. Uh, is a $50 subscription for a trial, and this is for people who have not seen it before. For $50, you get three months, and uh, you can sign up for it there. Um, you can also sign up, oh, one half a year is at $140, 
uh, one year is 250 and we have a special on the two years for 400 and that is um, the same prices that I had in 1977. Wow, so you haven't raised your, you, you, it hasn't inflated like uh, everything else, huh? Well, I've gone up on my consulting services, which are, uh, you know, person to person or company to person, and uh, so, that, that I've gone up a lot more. <laughs> uh, so you do do um, uh, person to person individual consulting? I do not do consulting on their uh, personal charts. I'm not that no, good. No, no, I meant in the way financial. So. In terms of financial, uh, I am available for that. Okay. Well, that's thousands, thousands. Well, I want to thank you for spending the time and talking to me, and I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I have a question: Will you? Are you willing to uh, have another conversation with me? Uh, let's say in December, if we're uh, good without a kill shot, and and uh, we still have the grid and and we can uh, get back together and talk about uh, what you see happening um, uh, next year. Well, I, I, hope, uh, I hope to God that these things are not as destructive as they look from the charts. So I hope we can do it. All right. Well, thank you. One, one thing I would say that the, the Romans keep, or I think they're required to keep two or three years of food and water in their homes and I strongly recommend that. Well, one of the things, and I want to go ahead and tell everybody listening too, is that I lived down in St. Croix when Hurricane Hugo hit. And I lost everything. And I lived without electricity for nine months. Okay? So, oh. uh, so you can do it. And then I'm also a Red Cross volunteer. And I went up to Sandy, New York last year. And I went down to New Orleans with Katrina. And if there's one thing you learn, it's it's not it's it's being able to ha you should have enough no matter what just like the people in New York and New Jersey never expected a strong hurricane to hit them up there people should have basic supplies water stored uh, some food stored and uh, uh, batteries there's they, you, they can go on FEMA.gov they can go on Red Cross it's just basics that everybody should have that's actually common sense. Absolutely. And, uh, I strongly recommend that. And I have, I have friends who sell gold and silver in uh, Tempe, Arizona, and I have friends that sell uh, food that will last 20 years uh, out in Big Fork, Montana. <laughs> yes. And, um, uh, and yeah, and people can can get the food, you know, that last year's. But thank you again, Arch, and I hope that people do take. Um, you, you're so good at what you do. I hope people do take it seriously. Go ahead, do some preparation for the just in case. And and just one more uh, uh, consideration about my accuracy. I have gone years where I haven't been particularly special or anything, and, and I have even uh, lost a couple of years, but I was the number one stock market timer in the country in 1987, 1994, and 2008, and number two in 2002. Wow. I was the one, number one in bond market, 1994, and number one in the gold market, 2006. So you're accurate. Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Arch. Have an awesome day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.